Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sign of the Times. Get ready. We're going to get into the struggle, a discussion about the black male tonight with a special guest. Who knows what he's talking about? Tag your friends, share this video, invite someone. Let's get ready to get down and dirty with the struggle, the plight, the future, and the hope of the black male. Get ready. Here we go. Sign of the Times. Once again, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. We're ready. I'm ready. I know you're ready for an awesome show tonight. Listen, before we go and, and get started tonight, I do want to challenge each and every one of you tonight. Hit the share button. Invite someone. We're going to have an awesome show tonight. I want, you, I want to challenge you to do that for us so that we can get this word out. We've been having an awesome discussion all week long. We're in the middle of some difficult days. We're in the middle of a virus, a pandemic that seems like it's shot down and now it's coming back. It's making a comeback. And we're right in the middle of some racial tension going on, but it's bringing a subject to the forefront that we need to talk about. And so tonight, I want to challenge you to sit back. I thank you for those of you that are joining us in your homes, joining us while you're chilling, joining us in your place of business. I am so proud to be able to serve you tonight by bringing to the forefront a guest and we're going to sit back last night we had a powerful panel discussion on monday night uh pastor kawana farrar came and we just had an awesome discussion and last night dr stephen gardner from phoenix arizona and dr david walker from orlando florida we had a panel discussion and it was just powerful and tonight my guest is going to join us in a second we're going to have a wonderful show tonight. I also want to challenge you to go to YouTube. Go to YouTube and search for Sign of the Times, David Bright Austin. All of our shows are there. Hit the subscribe button to our channel so that every time we add a show, you can go in. Listen, I also want to challenge you to do a watch party. The thing I love about a watch party is that you can start a watch party and then leave the party. Go and do whatever else you're doing on, on social media and other people will join and see we need to talk about this subject. This is a hot topic and we're going to get in it tonight. I want you to hit the like button and help me welcome my guest tonight to the screen. Welcome to Sign of the Times. He is a young man that knows what he's talking about and he'll explain and he'll, as, as we used to say, uh, coming up in church, he'll introduce himself. But I'll tell you a little bit about him. He is a social activist from the Baltimore, Maryland area and uh, who knows what he's talking about. And we're going to get a perspective what's happening in our community with our, our black males from Mr. Quasi Quasi France and Brother France, Mr. Brother Quasi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to sit back and talk with you about these, as you say, pressing issues in these trying times. All right. If you can do me a quick favor, maybe 
uh, tilt your camera just a little bit so down the other way because what we're going to do is uh, our guests, there you go, our guests are going to be putting comments and questions on the screen and I want them to cover your face, to, you know. Um, I see. Can you see look, me now? Yeah, I can see you. yours looks a little better than mine, so they want to cover mine, but maybe not yours. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little sure. bit about yourself and what, you, what you're doing in the Baltimore area, and then we're going to talk about, we're going to dive right in to the struggle, the plight, everything that we can squeeze out. You know, it's like uh, talking about the black male is sort of like uh, squeezing an orange. No matter how yeah. much you squeeze it, you're going to always squeeze some more juice out of it. And so no matter Absolutely. how much we talk about it, it's always something else. So tell us a little bit about yourself and let's squeeze the orange tonight. Sure. My name is Quasi France. I'm a founder of K KTB Media LLC, KillingTheBreeze.com, which is a media organization that seeks to archive, advance, and protect news, information, data, and perspectives from all all spectrums, uh, political spectrum, socioeconomic spectrums. I'm a teacher of U.S. history, uh, American government, and economics, as well as a SAT tutor and and uh, prep prep coordinator. I also do a little bit of work for the Democratic Party and have consulted or for mm, I guess. Five campaigns now, six campaigns. We just wrap one up. And most importantly, I guess I'm a lover of black people and a lover of uh, concise, concise, curt, frank discussion about issues that impact us and that impact the community. It's how I live my life and it's what I live my life to, uh, to forward. So, again, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Well, let's get right into it. In a nutshell, um, uh, I, I normally ask this question throughout the show, but I'm going to sure. start off by asking you this question because um, you're, you're in Baltimore. I'm from Philly. And because mm -hmm. I'm from Philly, I always throw this question in that most of my guests from Philly, there's a movie called Philadelphia with Denzel Washington and Tom Hanks in which Denzel is an attorney. And at one point he gets his uh, a witness on the stands and Denzel says, explain it to me like I'm a six year old. So I'm mm -hmm. going to ask you, explain it to me like I'm a six year old. What is going on with the black male in America? So I think we're having uh, uh, explaining to you like a six year old. We're having an awakening and a reckoning with what it means to be black and a man in America and what it means to be black and male in within our own community. So in, in America writ at large, what are we seeing? We're seeing Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment due process rights that have still been denied to us, basically, even though we we're supposed to get them originally when the country was founded. And then after the Civil War, we're seeing that they're still being denied, even though we went, we've gone through Reconstruction, we've gone through Jim Crow, and now we're in a quote unquote post racial, post Obama America. So what we're seeing is not only our own reckoning and awakening, but we're being witnessed by the rest of the country, the reckoning and awakening that's happening with black males mm -hmm. and with black people generally. I don't want to leave sisters out either, but I think it's black, black men are particularly the focus because of what we're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. The greatest thing you can make an argument and we all know our ancestors, we all pay homage to them, our forefathers, those who went, those who were in the struggle before us, and we were talking about this beforehand. I was giving you a little bit about my family history. But in 2020, we can make an argument that the greatest weapon Black America has ever had in, in, get, in garnering justice racially and legally has been the cell phone camera. It's wow. tough to deny what's wow. happening to yeah. us, right? Wow, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not just the camera. The cell phone cam, you know, because cameras are yep. obsolete. <laughs> cameras are obsolete itself. Well, everybody has a phone now that has a camera with it. So no matter what happens, you can see, you can see no matter what happens at any time, everybody has their phone with them. And as a result, they can stop and record. It's tough now to deny these things that are happening. The old racial playbook, the old racist playbook, he deserved it. He was a criminal. He resisted arrest. 
all of those things are being thrown out the window now, right? Because right. we have the footage. Here's yeah. what happened. And there's no way to deny it. So the, the fact that they said they have body cameras really is irrelevant. We have our own cameras. Bingo. You, you, you said you said uh, you said an awakening and a reckoning. Uh, let's talk about that because you said it on two levels. There are two things that we're struggling with. We're struggling with being the black man in America. And that's what mm -hmm. we want to talk about. That's our topic. That's our subject. Let's talk about the black man in America. But just as important, do you agree, is the black man in his own community? Bingo. Yes. I think that's I think that's more. I think that may arguably be. I don't want to say more important because we're all within this. We're all within a framework. All of us as black people, and particularly black men, we live within this framework of the United States of America, not only the geographical borders, but also the legal and societal framework. So we have that. That has to be settled first. But we're also seeing within the community things that have to be rectified as well. So what and here's what I mean. So for example, we aren't we aren't going to be able to be to move forward as Americans, sans race, without equal citizenship that all Americans get, being the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution that has to apply to us, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly the Reconstruction Amendments with the 14th Amendment being the most important. That's equal protection under the law. Really, the 5th and 14th Amendments are what we as Black men want, right? We want to be able to have due process. So if you're George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery or Michael Brown, or anybody who wants to be painted as quote unquote doing something wrong or having a bad past, mm -hmm. then we want to have those due process rights, right? If you come across a police officer or an armed guard, you want to be able to say, hey, I want to be able to have my hearing and I want to be able to have notice of that hearing. I don't want to end up dead. That's not due process. That's right. judge, jury, and executioner. And right. that's certainly not equal protection under the law because the things that are happening to us don't happen to white people who are under the same or similar set of circumstances. So that's one thing. But within the community, as we see the rise of Black Lives Matters, we have questions within the own community for black men. And maybe not me and you, brother, because we're probably outside of the target area. Mm -hmm. But the, I, the natural response that you certainly hear from white people to protect white supremacy, but you also hear from black people in response to what's going on is what? What about black on black crime? You always hear that, right? Always hear that. So now we're having a reckoning kind of sort of, we're, kind of, we're having a, I hate to say come to Jesus moment, but we're having a, hey, we, we want to focus on what things that are happening externally, but we have these questions internally also that need to be solved. Now, before any, before people jump on me, know that, hey, I'm 100% behind Black Lives Matter. Cien por ciento. And my response to the what about Black on Black crime is, well, the, the, the people who kill white people overwhelmingly are white. white. Right. Who kill Asian people overwhelmingly are Asian. Right. The people who kill Latino people overwhelmingly are Latino. I, I'm not sure if it's biblical, I think it is, and going back to it, uh, we 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 covet what we see. We kill, well, therefore we kill or we love the things that are closest to us. So it's going to be black people. Now, yeah, if you're a black community. person. That's exactly. in your community. Yeah. Exactly. And we have all sorts of organizations, the church, uh, nonprofits, uh, dedicated individuals that are wholly involved and engaged in the whole black on quote unquote black on black crime and I hate that term but it's but it's in the zeitgeist that are fully engaged in addressing it. But as far as black men are concerned, we're part of that greater general group of American citizens. The most dangerous group of citizens are men age 15 to 24, which is why I say me and you are probably 
outside of the mm -hmm. ire or the focus mm -hmm. of Barely. what that black on black crime would be. Yeah, most yeah. of us who are killing, most of us involved in crime are men within our black community are men, teenagers to early 20s, 15 to 24. So that that's the duality. How do we reconcile? How do we reconcile with being black in America as American citizens? And then how do we reconcile ourselves as black men within the black community as far as our own actions are concerned? What is our struggle with uh, or is there a struggle with the black male? And, and, and I want to deal with before we deal with nationally, I think, like you said, we need to deal with the fact that we have a struggle in our own community. Is there mm -hmm. a problem? Or, or, or how would you address the fact that we are always trying to rise in the hierarchy of our community, whether it's the being the gang leader, whether it's mm -hmm. being the best, um, the best basketball player in my neighborhood, whether, you know, talk about let's talk about that. So competition is that's innate in that kind of sort of national thing, because we're capitalists, right? You want to be the best. You want to kind of sort of have dominion over others. That's a philosophical state of nature with there are no rules, who's the strongest, who's the smartest, who's the fastest. What we've always seen within the black community is that we've been confined, right? You can only live here. You can only work here. You can only do this. You can only learn that. that again, that's 300, we're saying 1619, is when the first African slave came, uh, touched down to Jamestown, then we're talking about 400 years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, th and 350 of which we lived in either slavery or apartheid, Jim Crow. Right. So we haven't really been citizens with a full range of uh, opportunity and a full, a full menu of options that quote unquote most American citizens have. So we are confined in our communities. And then that's what happens. We turn on one another mm -hmm. or we try to outdo one another because that's all we know is what we have. We don't have access to everything. We only have access to what we're allowed to have access to. Right. So so I mean, what, so what, where do we go? What is the what is the role of the black male in our community? What is the responsibility? Let, let me rephrase that. What do you think the responsibility of the black male is in his community? So we have to lead. And right now we aren't leading. What, okay. what we're being carried and people, a lot of black men I talk to don't like to hear this. But in that same kind of overall regard, you know what demographic is acquiring education at the highest rate and getting employed at the highest rate in all entire the country, all people, black women. What does that tell you? That tells you that black women, and it's scary as a race because propagation of the species, that's science, right? Reproduction, all of that good stuff, intact family units, things that we learn, um, things that were taught within the Bible, things that were all religions and gender that work socioeconomically are, we aren't seeing. And what are those things, right? How do you, how, how do, let's say we had all of our rights. Let's say racism was completely eliminated and we didn't have to worry about that. We would probably still struggle at least at the beginning because we are, we don't do the things that it takes to be successful. One, Graduate one, go to college, graduate from college. Two, get married. Get married. Three, have children. Anybody, Asian, Latino, white, black, who is at, who is in the socioeconomic strata that's not poor, that's middle class or up, those are the those are the the those are the uh elements that they all share in common. You go, you graduate from college and we're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about education in the terms of, hey, like make sure you learn what these white people teach you. We're talking about education just solely in the terms of, I have this credential within our capitalist society because we eliminate ourselves from a lot of jobs and all people do uh, without that college degree. And really you need more than that in this capitalist society. We have to get married. Mm -hmm. Intact family units are a must. 
not only because not only do they promote promote social cohesion, but they also promote stability, stability within the community. We have too many families that aren't really families. And again, you're talking with the product of a single mother who I think did a hell of a job. She raised me. I'm JD MBA. My brother's a doctor. So she did her job, but she did it, but not a lot of women are as resolute as my mom is. And we need black men there. We need black male role models. I had them, even though my dad wasn't around. My even though my dad wasn't around like he should have been. My grandfathers on both my sides, on both my dad's side and my mom's side were there. And that they that's what taught me how to be a man. We have too many black men who are learning how to be men from the streets or from music or from media and not having that role model that's there. Right. That's true. What about uh, we talked about this last night? Maybe we can touch on it and keep going. We talked about the the stereotype of the black male. What do you think the stereotype of the black male is in America? And what do you think the stereotype of the black male is in his community? Because those are two so different, what, two different things. It's it's very much two different things, but where because we're a, we're a community within a larger community, and because white supremacy and white patriarchy is real, a lot of the times the stereotypes of black uh, black men and black people really are influenced by that larger whiter uh, influence. For example, people are shocked when I tell them that the majority of black uh, black people who are registered to vote voted. There's this huge kind of misnomer that's like, oh, black people don't vote. We do. In fact, we vote in greater numbers than white people did. Not in 2000, not in 2016, 16. but in 2018 and certainly for Obama. So we, we are conditioned to think, hey, and as a teacher who teaches black men mainly, overwhelmingly, it's sports, it's music, it's entertainment. That's that's the avenue out. It's, oh, uh, I want to I don't want to do what I have to do. I want to do what's enough. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we fall short in doing enough or we lower our expectations in saying what enough is. Mm -hmm. So those stereotypes that are of the larger community definitely permeate our own community. But uh, we have to be honest. There's always a basis of reasoning of truth within any stereotype. Right. So we do have we do have black men who aren't doing enough. I think you and I would both agree with that. Mm -hmm. But the majority of us are doing enough for uh, another per uh, the majority of us not are doing enough. But what people's projections of enough would be for non black people, white people, Asian people, Latino people, black men are doing that also. For instance, fathers, we, we talked about black fathers, right? And the family unit is not there. There definitely has been a disintegration of the family unit. But there's the amount of contact that Black fathers have with their children are on par or even higher than white families, than white, than white fathers, Latinos fathers, Asian fathers in the same circumstances. So, for example, if I get married and I get divorced and I have kids, as a Black person, as a Black man, I, my contact with my kids are no worse or better than it is for whites, Asians, Latinos. If I'm black and married, my contact is not better for whites, Asians, Latinos. If I'm black and I have a kid and never got married, my contact with my kid is not worse than black than whites, Latinos or Asians. So a lot of the stereotypes are not true, even though they may be based in some truth and they come from that larger and I mean, for lack of a better, I'm not afraid to say, I've never been to say it, that larger white community that is the United States of America, because it's bathed and inundated in whiteness. Uh, stereotype slash profiling. Let me ask you Baby this dog. question. Let me ask you this question about profiling, stereotype or perception. There will mm -hmm. be one perception of you and I in our community. There'll be another mm -hmm. perception of you and I in America. Let me explain what I mean by that. And you tell me, what do you think the perception would be physically if white America or 
white America, Latino America, whoever would see you and see me. Sure. You know, my daughter so, told me one time that my hair was Taco Bell because it was, <laughs> it's going south for the border. <laughs> and so, if someone see you with your dreads, they get a perception about you. And I purposely, I purposely wore this shirt, this dress shirt. I had a mm -hmm. black shirt with a, a, a African symbol on. I was going to wear. I found in the closet. But I said, you know what? I'm gonna wear this just to paint a picture of how people will perceive me versus how they will perceive you with your style. Absolutely, and it's and perception matters, right? That first look matters, right? Particularly what we're seeing in society right now, it's a carrying on of, it's kind of sort of an extension of what we've seen throughout history, right? Which is scary, right? Okay. I'm black, I have dreads, I've got a beard, scary. Yeah. That's what yeah. society says. Right. If we can't, you and I, we can't wear our resume on our chest, on our sleeve, right? We can't wear our experiences, like you talked about your shirt, I can't say, hey, I graduated from a private school. You're in Philly. I'm a Penn grad. I went to Penn and graduated okay. from Penn. Right. Now, like I, you can't wear that. And so uh, from somebody who's had guns pulled on them by cops, been stopped several times, pulled over several times, with you're black, you're black, which is why I tell other black people, and they know who they are, who seem to think that the problem is inward is with black people we can't fix ourselves we can't fix what's going on within our community until we are a whole community in the united states of america so what does that mean that means hey these dreads or hey that shirt that you wanted to wear it doesn't have to signify anything larger other than what it means to us but a shirt like uh, a shirt with a like with uh, the African shirt that you were going to wear to society at large and it trickles into our community, it means something. We're perceived a certain way. We should be able to wear a dashiki or kente cloth just because that's what that should be within the greater zeitgeist of acceptable things to wear, right? right. We don't think of, for instance, if a, a Scottish, a white Scottish man wears a kilt, we don't think of anything other than, hey, that's a white guy with a kilt. But if right. you see a black person with dreads or you see a black person in kente claw or black person and I see somebody talking about assimilation and he's absolutely correct. They're not. He's absolutely correct. We're taught to be anglicized. Everything has to be what's acceptable is what's white. And that's and that's that's something that would have to change. Right. <laughs> um, we see and we see we can look at the tradition of. Black nationalists on the kind of sort of the fringe. You got the uh, the black Israelites, and then kind of sort of what would be the I think they would be in the fringe even in the black community. But what would be fringe in the greater white community? And I've had this conversation, which is completely normal to us, is the Nation of Islam. Right? Okay. They have it assimilated. They created like their own state, and what's acceptable within that black state is just completely normal. But within that greater white state, you see brothers with suits selling bean pies or selling newspapers, and you automatically have that assumption of they're a part of this as opposed to them just being members of society at large, the greater society at large who do, who do things. The, I think that assimilation point that Stephen Gardner brought up is brilliant. <laughs> Somebody's going to rock that, rock that afro, Mr. Smith. Do it. Uh, it's one thing that I tell my kids. It's the one thing I tell my kids teaching because they're always, they're kind of sort of in awe. And it's a one way it, it fulfills me in what I'm doing, David. Another way it makes me sad because I teach now. Um, they know I own a business. Mm. Uh, they knew at, at one point, I'm originally born and raised in Baltimore, but I was living in New York for 13 years and I was traveling back and forth between Baltimore and New York when I moved back. Um, so they know I have a business. They know I kind of sort of travel. I come and go as I please. I go to many places. They see I have dreads, but I wear a suit. 
they're confused. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't know many black men like you. Yeah. And I, I, I tell them, like, that's like an oxymoron. It, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Really? And I tell them that's part of it. I tell them, I tell them, don't run away from who it is that you are. If you do what you're supposed to do, and the 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 person who talked about uh, assimilation is key. You don't have to assimilate in that way where you have to be anglicized, where you have to be Europeanized. You can assimilate in the way that takes care of yourself, right. that takes care of yourself and your community. And that goes back to the things that I talked about before: getting married, graduating from college, getting married, having kids. You do that, you're gonna be okay. There's very few what what's happening. And it's not to say that you're going to be rich because a lot of kids and a lot of people are just focused on being rich and making a lot of money. And I try to tell them it's about being comfortable. You want to be able to take care of your family and you want to be able to help out and advance the interests of your community. If you become wealthy doing that, that's great. But that should be a baseline, a bottom baseline for the, the our community, which is 13 percent of the American population. There are more Latinos now in this country than black people. They surged by us in the yeah. late 90s. And of course, white people are about 63% now. Mm. Latinos are 20. We're at 13. Asians are at six. Everybody else is at one. That's the demographic breakdown. Um, I had a phone call today. I spoke with a young man that called me today and asked me for some help, some guidance, some ideas and pointers because he feels like, you know what? Now is the time for me to jump into the political realm to let my voice be heard. And I was very excited because I ran for office four years ago and I shared with him my experience and I shared with him, you know, of course, when you lose an election, it's a painful thing because you were rejected. Mm -hmm. I said, but when, once the pain leaves, you have this sense of self pride that at least I stepped up to make a difference. I didn't just sit. Where? What is the role of the black man in his community, not nationwide, nationwide, uh, as with President Obama? But what is the role of the black male in his own community in the political realm? You just hit the nail on the head. We can't just. You just hit the nail on the head. And again, it's not a national thing. We we can certainly excuse me, localize it to our community, but because we're a small we're a small part of the larger tapestry that is this country, it ends up being nationally. We have to take control over our own issues. We have to take power over our own communities, and it's not just and it's not just uh, the activism. It's not just the church. It's not just nonprofits because we actually do a pretty good job of that in those arenas. It has to be politically. It has to be economically. It has to be uh, another layer of that social is uh, mentorship and or slash professional organizations. But we got it. But I, I love it when I hear brothers like you say that you ran for office. We have to have that. We have to have that. And it's not just black faces implementing white policy. Because we know white supremacy and patriarchy are an issue. Those are going to have to take, though, unfortunately, those issues are going to have to be toppled uh, over decades, right? It took us 350 years to get here. Then 68 happened, excuse me. And now we're all of a sudden supposed to be in this post apartheid, post slavery state, which I guess we were trying to, com we were convinced. Or people tried to convince us was post racial because we got a black president, right? Right. <laughs> so, right. Now, <laughs> so now racism is in. You and I both know that's nonsense, but it starts with that. Which, in, in my in my ideal my ideal quote unquote black man for his community is somebody who runs for office, mm -hmm. who starts a business, and who volunteers for children. That's what it is. It's a role model for the youngins. It's a financial base that helps feed into the community. And it's also a political base that helps advocate for the community, not only within, but at large as well. Well, you see, I work, I've been working in the school system for the last 20 years. Yes. And uh, when you see my paycheck, you will agree that I do volunteer. 
<laughs> I know what that's about. I, I, I'm, I'm a school you see my picture, <laughs> I'm a, I am an official. I went into a school one day and I put a volunteer sticker on. They said, Mr. Austin, why you put a vol? I said, look at my paycheck and I volunteer. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I cannot thank you enough for <laughs> running for office. I can't thank you enough for reaching out to these kids. And I can't thank you enough for hosting this platform to talk about these issues. Because a lot of times, and again, people look at, again, people look at me funny. Um, we can't, we aren't going to be able to solve the issues within our own community until we get on that plane where the we are 100% American citizens because we aren't right well, now we aren't we have we've you, never been once we think, get to, go ahead go ahead go ahead once we get to that hey all of our rights and protections that are afforded to all Americans are afforded to black people once we have that then we look inward Hey, what's going on with our black men? Hey, what's going on? Do college fraternities have a social responsibility to the black? Absolutely, they do. I see that question, um, and that kind of sort of goes. That kind of kind of sort of ties into the answer. Absolutely, black fraternities have a uh, social response, uh, social responsibility to the community. All black people do have a responsibility to the community because we're a minority. It has to. It can't be about us alone. It has to be about us within this greater white sea. Du Bois talked about a double consciousness, right? Yes. What and I think and as black men, I can tell you're probably one also. We think about this even when we don't think about it, right? That's the whole mm -hmm. idea. The actions that we're undertaking, what does it look like to black people and what does it look like to the greater white community? So again, I'm all, all a free expression, right? You see, I got drag, I got a beard. I'm all about be who you are, but understand what that means and understand how you advocate or explain that to the community that's outside of yours. So I can do this, but if I have, for instance, my pants below my butt cheeks, mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. That's okay. you wear your clothes however you want to, but you're going to have to explain that to the greater community at large. What right. does that look like? Right. And if somebody asks you why, do you have an intelligent response to, to the why are you wearing your pants like that with this is who I am, this is a free expression, or do you have I'm just doing this because that's what everybody else is doing, or what's worse, I'm doing this because that's what I'm supposed to do? Question, um, and, and I have a lot of pastors and ministers and preachers on here. But this question here is outside of the box of religion. This is one that I would not ask them. But as a historian, what uh -huh. has been the role, uh, the the effect on the black male? What has been the role of hip hop in, in that hip hop and, and rap over the years and where we are today? So I, I, I again, I'm a hip hop aficionado. I'm not only my historian generally, but a hip hop aficionado also, an historian as well. So I remember Chuck D, Public Enemy, he was mm -hmm. saying, you know, hip hop was just, you know, that's the CNN of the streets, right? That's the CNN of the black community. It's what's going right. on, right? Right. What's happened since? What's happened over the course? Cool Herc was seventy four. So what's happened over the course of the last forty five years? Well, what, ha what happens to anything that becomes popular in a capitalist country? It gets commodified. So now, who are most hip-hop listeners? Are they black or white? They're white people. Who are most, who are most hip-hop? Who's at it? Who, who are going to rap concerts? You go to rap concerts, you go to hip-hop concerts, who's there mostly? Is it black people or white people? It's white people. Who runs the, who, who runs the uh, record industry? It's white people. So now we're getting kind of sort of bastardization, a commodification of what the art form was, which was, hey, this is what's going on that's not being told, to now this is what sells to my white customer base. This is what white executives see uh, works profit-wise. So you're going to have not necessarily a music from us, but a music that's a capitalist commodity now that sells. And so you're going to get, and what 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 sells to a white audience? Black men as violent, 
black men right. as rebellious <laughs> and, and uncontrollable. Right. right. <laughs> um, black women that are highly sexualized. Right. Uh, or uh, black or, or, or stereotyped as satsy or uncontrollable. Really, feral is the term that they used to use, right? Like out in the wild, uh, and, uh, you know, that out in nature. So that's what's happened now. And again, I still love hip hop. I still listen to it, but I'm 38 years old. So I know and, you know, I, I run a business. I understand marketing and target markets and strategies. Like that's what we're seeing now. What we're seeing now is a product. It's less of a... It's less of a rebellious art form looking for attention from the greater community and more of a packaged commodity sold to the sold to the greater community. And when we say greater community, we're talking about white people. And and so basically what, what you're saying is that we can take that conversation right back and talk about the twin sister that we talked about in the beginning, black on black crime. You got We're it. Marketing that to the greater community. Because you got it. It sells. Why, yeah, it sells. Why That's why we, talk, we hear about it, right? Right. What why sells? Do we, why do we talk about that all the time? Because it sells. It sells. It sells. It sells. You got it. In. It sells MSNBC. Bingo, bingo, bingo. We've got white media executives for a largely white audience with very few black stakeholders and black people in that decision making process. So you get also, we're seeing blunders now, right? You saw like the, uh, what was it? The Calvin Klein and Benetton ad with the little black child that had the cotton on the front and people, they had to take it down, right? And it's like, it's like, who would, like, how could they make such a stupid, insensitive, like, ad? And it's mm -hmm. very easy because there's nothing but white people in the room that made the decision to run that ad. Right. So there was nobody, so there's, so there's nobody to uh, say, no, don't do that, right? Right. Who am I still listening to hip hop wise? Like I said, I listen to everything because, I take it as what it is. It's a product that's not marketed to me, 38-year-old uh, black man. It's marketed to, you know, teenage white person. So right. I take that from what it is. But who I listen to that still has a message, J. Cole has a message. Kendrick Lamar has a message. Um, even although for many of us he sold out, Kanye West has a message. Older billionaire, uh, kind of sort of role model Jay Z now has a message, right? Where he talks about what you want to do with your money, what you want to do with your time, how it is you want to act. So, a lot of the older people, a lot of the older cats have messages now. Um, but again, the art form has grown so much and it's so popular now that, you know, messages of black unity, black. Up look up growth, black strength, like that doesn't really sell to the target audience. Right. Guns, it's, drugs, it's alcohol. Good. Yeah, exactly. Guns, drugs, alcohol, sex. Like that's what sells. I had a conversation the co last week, I believe it was, where someone posted something on social media about the pulling down of the Aunt Jemima character. Uh huh. And they were, what do you call them? The greater. The greater, what do you call them? the greater people? The greater, they were no, the greater, greater community at large. The greater community at large, yeah, is the yeah. one. It's a safe way to say white people, right? <laughs> and they're laughing about. It. They were saying, you know, never. Oh, I gotta have something. And my comment was, now is not the time to make fun of us. No. And they no. said, well, historically, she made millions, and I didn't respond. But anyone that studies that know that. The, the, she didn't make millions. She didn't so, make millions. No. She didn't make, <laughs> they no, read not at all. Thing saying she made, she worked up until the time she was died. died. Exactly. But uh -huh. they said because someone made millions from the character she made, and and then it was said to me, "Get over it." Yeah, Stop playing the victim role. It's so funny how you always hear that, right? From the same people who are upset. That we're taking down Confederate statues, and and Confederate flags. Yeah. Those same people are always telling us to get over it and stop being victims. These are the same people who complain that, oh, like my job is being taken away because uh, a quote unquote lower, qual lesser qualified black person or minority is taking it. And again, 
it's all what's so what's so delicious and great about this happening right now, David, is the fact that it's kind of sort of the it's kind of sort of MLK's dream. And John Lewis talks about it. You see who's in the streets? It's not me. That's a lot of white people in the streets. Yeah. It's a lot of, and it makes it tough, right? That's why you're seeing this police stuff happen as well. We've been getting killed. We've been getting beat up, killed, shot by cops forever, right? Modern policing was slave catching, right? There were slave patrols. That's how it started. Right. Right. That's how it started. What's happened is thanks to this pandemic, everybody's at home. Nobody's working. Everybody's everybody gets to focus on certain things. We're seeing a whole failure of government, of that greater community at the state, local, and federal levels. And people are like, put people are putting one plus plus one and one together. It's like, hey, mm-hmm. I'm white and I'm seeing government fail. Like cops are agents of the state. That's the extent, that's the that is the disciplinary extension of government. And it's, I do believe that they're failing black people. I see the video. I see the statistics. That makes me mad. I want to go out in the streets. I yeah. want to go out in the streets. And let so what read. we're having, let me take a look at this. I want to. I can I, read it because it's uh, quite lengthy. Uh, Kim Mitchell says that our teenage black boys are still heavily influenced by gangster rap lyrics. Mm-hmm. Most teens in inner cities aspire to become a rapper. That's true. I agree sort of like yep. being uh, the next LeBron. Uh, yep. our, our community still listens to rap music, but I agree, white kids are purchasing and attending concerts. She's 100% correct. Ken Mitchell's 100% correct. All of that is true. And I would say that aspiration to be gangster rappers are because there are not enough black role models to be like, hey, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be a plumber, you can be a dentist, you can be a contractor, you can be a construction worker. You can you can live your life where you can satisfy the wants and needs of your family and still be content without having to do those things. Well, let, what, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Quasi. It, it can, uh-huh. could, could we attribute part of that to the fact that the rapper he dresses, he, he dresses even though he doesn't live in my community. Uh-huh. You would think he's a part of the community because of his videos, because of how yep. he carries himself. But the doctor, what doctor lives, you know, and I, you know, I'm I'm in North yeah. Carolina, but I was born and raised in Philly. What mm-hmm. doctor has his own practice that's living in North Philly? Bingo, that's part of the issue, right? So when we, we make it successful and we leave. And we leave, right? And it's okay. Everybody wants safety, security for their family, like safety, security for their family. Everybody has the right to do whatever it is they want to do. If you leave, so you're from Philly, right? If you if you're in North Philly and you make it you successful and you want to move out to Mount Airy, that's fine. Come back in the community and volunteer to Boys and Girls Club. Right. Coach a basketball, co- coach a team, tutor on the weekends. Do something that so do something so that our kids can see that you exist, that you're present, that you're real. Because for a lot of kids, and we teach them, I know you teach them, I teach them, and Kim talked about it. It's I want to be a rapper, or like you said, I want to be LeBron. And we all know the chances of that happening are minuscule, minuscule. So, but the chances of but if you graduate from high school, go to college, get married have kids, you're going to be straight. You're not, you may not be a uh, rapper rich. You may not be LeBron rich or famous or successful, but you're going to be able to take care of your family and you're going to be able to live comfortably. Now there are obviously there are economic issues of the greater society at large that affect us that talk about <coughs> wages and uh, upward mobility and stuff like that. And that's a larger conversation, but if you graduate from college, get married, have kids, you're pretty much guaranteeing your, yourself what used to be called the American dream, right? Which but is a place to live. American, but how much is the American dream? You know, we keep tying this thing in. How much the American dream deals with assimilation? Because looking yeah. at the screen, 
uh, a black, a 16 year old black male can look at this screen and mm -hmm. you tell me if they had to pick on the screen, which one of us was the met, the MD, the doctor, and which one of us is the rapper. Yeah. Yeah. Yo, you're right. You're absolutely right. And it's one of those things where looking at us, which one? <laughs> yeah. They're looking at us. That's what I'm saying. Like they don't, they'll never it's, and that's all about, that's all about where our lack of really just presence of being there. Like we have to be there. If you're, I don't care what happens, where, what you're doing or what it is, we all have shared knowledge. I can tell. So you had a young, you had a young brother call you looking for advice politically, right? He knows right. you've done it. He knows you that you've been there. And he know therefore he thinks and knows that you can help him. There are not enough of us there. I yeah. and particularly in education, I'm sure you have the same thing that I see. Like they're overwhelmed and there's nothing wrong with again, I applaud black women. I live for black women. Like I was raised by black women. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, a lot of our black men, they only see black women, whether it's school, whether it's at home. And then there isn't that black male role model to be like, hey, like, I know what you're going through or, hey, you don't want to do that. Do this. So it's not assimilation in that European, like, you've got to dress this way. You've got to talk this way. Mm -hmm. Not that I reject that. And I'm somebody who, mm -hmm. you know, went to a private school and went to and, and graduated from an Ivy League university and, you know, graduated from law school, has a JD MBA. And uh, so I graduated from law school and I have a business school degree. I reject that. You do not have to anglicize yourself. You do not have to whiten yourself up to be successful. But what you do need are those socio, political, economic, capitalist markers in, or in order to basically sustain yourself. And there is, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, graduating from college, <laughs> getting married, having kids. When I explained, they were like, why do you need to have kids? Kids seem crazy. Yes, they do. All three of those things take discipline. They're hard, Mr. Gardner. That is correct. <laughs> I don't have to tell you guys that. Marriage is hard. Raising kids is hard. Uh, uh, academic uh, excellence at a higher level is hard. And we can go into, I know you have things to say about that, David. We can go into our schools and how they're probably doing us a disservice as of this point, as far as how they're educating us and preparing us for not only higher education, but the workforce in general. Right. But those three things are crucial. And again, they don't guarantee we're all, we all have issues. Everything touches upon us. Mental health, mm -hmm. drug addiction, general things. Like they touch upon us like they touch upon everybody else. But, a gar but uh, I can tell you this much. If you graduate from college, get married, have kids, Generally, you'll have more. I'm not going on where you don't have what do they say? The idle hands, what do they say about idle hands and the devil? I don't, right? And that's, why, and that's why Mr. Gardner's point was so important. Like, those things are they take discipline and they take time. Question, and as a, go ahead. Question, um, as um, as Earl says, all hard, all are hard, but yep. all are rewarding. Question, yep. um. Is there such thing as we are a minority as African Americans mm -hmm. or uh, I don't know what we are because I'm, you know, at my age, I've experienced being Negro. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what we are. But as a minority, are, is there such a thing as being a minority within the minority? Sure. What would you that consider? Who is the minority in the minority? So I would say the minority within the minority within as far as black people are concerned or minorities within minorities generally. Minority in the black race. Is there a minority within the black race? Sure. We have sure we have minorities in the black race. And that was we were actually talking about before the call. That's what that uh black men or the white men or black people or whatever. So for instance, we have uh LGBT. That's not okay. that's not those those issues aren't big within the black community, but L black LGBT are black people, too. So they suffer from the same issues that 
us black straight people do. So mm-hmm. we have, so and that's one thing that I particularly focus on, and I think it's why I've kind of sort of been successful in other communities outside of my own as minorities. And I teach and I talk about this and I teach this with other groups. Like we have to understand what it means to be a minority, right? So mm-hmm. if I'm black. What do I look like hating on Latinos? Because right. you know they, they may be competing for jobs with uh, other people who might be black. Like we're all Latinos aren't the problem. White people are the problem. Like we got we have to stay focused on what it is on what the issues are at hand. Uh, or what do I look like being concerned about? You know. Uh, whatever my religious concern, whatever my religious affiliations are, what am I, what, what am I concerned if, you know, uh, two black gay men want to get married or whatever, like mm. whatever they want to call it, I don't care. Like it's what it is. Like, I just want to see a thriving If I want to see thrive, black people thrive, no matter what it is there are. So we definitely have minorities within the minority but we're all black people. Like that's what we have to take account for. And then as not at the general level, but a step below that as minorities, blacks, Latinos, uh, although women are the majority population wise, they're minority when it comes to power. um, We're all in this against really one foe. And it's not a foe, but it's historically, it's what it is. It's white men. I even look at some white women who are problematic and I'm like, you're worried about, you know, black people in the streets. Like, what are white men doing for you? Look at your history. Like, they aren't on your side. Like, we got to vote before you could. And then they start to think about that. And there's a galvanation. There's there's kind of sort of a galvanizing effect of, hey, I never really thought about it that way. I don't even really know any black people. Why am I mad at black people when my my issue as a white woman are basically white men who've gotten in my way. And then it becomes uh, you know, you know who gets in my way a lot? White men too. And then you can go move forward. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's 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 interesting. Uh let me ask this. I hope I don't know what's final question. We've been on here an hour. It doesn't sure, seem I, like I love the conversation. Yeah. yeah, great conversation. And we're just squeezing juice. <laughs> um I'm gonna um, another thing I normally do is open a can of worms and I'm going to open a big major can of worms because I feel like you can handle it. So sure. as, as blacks, we say that we have a political affiliation to a party, the Democratic uh-huh. Party. Most of us say we're Democratic. Most of us also say that we love, we just love President Obama. Oh, he sure. people still post on social media. He was my president. Yeah. Yet. There's a topic that as blacks, as Democrats, as lovers of Obama, that we sweep under the carpet. And that is the topic of what you brought up a moment ago, which is the LBGT, the uh, the, that, the, the community, mm-hmm. because as, as Democrats, we histor- we're saying we support their right to do that. You have a president in President Obama that says they have a right to do that. But yet Mm -hmm. we love him, but we sweep that concept under the carpet. Yeah. So I think so what happens is and we talked about that a little bit before as black people. So the LGBT issues, while there are black LGBT, that's not really a black issue, is it? Our issues oftentimes get superseded right and by oftentimes i mean always in this country like unless we start looting rioting burning and then they know we're serious um with obama and he's it's a complicated topic again i'm of that i i'm my emotions say we have black president you know a lot of people's political awakening was as a result of that it was the most successful campaign of all time we had, he had 72 million people vote for him in 2008. I don't think we'll see those numbers for a long time as right. far as the num- as far as total numbers of votes. Has. But you a black man. I'm a black man. We got black people listening. You know what it's you know, what's really hard 
being the first black something. That's really hard. Yeah. That, <laughs> that's really hard. So I, I look at Obama like I would look at Jackie Robinson, right? Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, right? Was there still racism in baseball after Jackie Robinson? Of course there was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was, was did Jackie Robinson cure all of baseball's ills when it came to that? No, he did not. Obama's the exact same way. And we see Obama in ourselves, right? As far as his evolution on, for instance, that issue. Obama wasn't pro-gay marriage. Think about it. I'm, I can remember being in college and at Penn, super progressive, super liberal, but gay marriage wasn't an issue. It just wasn't even thought of. And right. then as, like all activist groups, like all minority groups do, as they infiltrated twofold, right? You start at the bottom with the court system and the politics. And then what's visible is the top, being out in the streets. Bingo, mm -hmm. Mr. Gardner, United Front. You'll never know. You'll never know who your who your allies are going to be and where they're going to come from. What happened is as that grew, the bottom infiltration being the uh, politicians and the behind the scenes work that gets legislation passed, like we saw with civil rights starting with Plessy in late 19th century, going all the way through the Civil Rights Act that took. 80 years, right? <laughs> that we saw that happen with gay, particularly at Stonewall, which started, what, in the, the 60s, the 50s, and moved all, it took 50, 60 years for it to finally happen. So that's not, it's not a black issue, mm -hmm. but it's an issue, it's a minority issue. When we saw Obama, a black, while, again, he's biracial, we look at him, he's black. And then, of course, what helped him, and it's a community issue, you and I know it, is his white kids. They black. If Obama was married to a white woman, does he get elected? Probably not. A question. <laughs> Let me ask you this, because here's my question. I, I asked someone last week. You, you're asking if he was married to a white woman, would he get elected? Would he have got elected? Because I said that he was elected and he walked into the White House. <laughs> it was, it was uh, himself. It was Michelle. It was yes. Sasha. And it was Malia. Yep. yep. If he walked, what if he walked into the White House? Would he have walked into the White House if it was himself, if it was Michelle, if it was Sasha, and it was Malik? If he Good had a question. a boy, Good question. A son if he had a boy that looked like you, that had the yeah. bread like you. So I think, I think as long as the kids were black he would be okay. And I understand what your message is saying about the kind of sort of, the, it was more acceptable because it was black women. And obviously that brings up greater issues of how we look at women as being more docile and less threatening than if it were him and another black man going in the office. I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But I think what was most important for Obama was that his family was black. Because if, if he had a white wife and you know, light skin, mixed white looking kids, uh, he would get rejected. He would have he wouldn't have been wholly accepted by us in the black community, particularly oh. black women. Okay, you're saying, okay, I got you, because I'm I'm sick, like what, but you're saying from us we would have rejected him. We would have rejected him. Yeah. We would have yeah. rejected him. If 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 if, it, if Obama walked into if Obama was trying to get into the White House with with Rebecca as his wife, right, and Karen and uh, Chad, uh, yeah, Karen, yeah, and Karen and Channing as his kids. No, that wouldn't have happened. We'd have, right. we'd have looked at him funny, but right. he went with Michelle, not just a black woman, a dark skinned black woman. His but kids would, are. But would the would, would the would the white community have voted for him with Malik with the dreads? I think they would have, because I think Obama was a common. What we're seeing actually right now in 2020 is a lot of what we're seeing in 2008. Um, I think whenever there's a whole scale failure of government, and we saw that with the 2008 crash, that's when white people start to question this whole system. 
this whole white supremacist patriarchal system where it's like, hey, this isn't necessarily working for me. Yeah. Uh, I've been able to talk with a lot of, uh, and we obviously we're focused on the black community because we're black people. And you talked about our affiliation with the Democratic Party. Again, it's not, and I think we can be honest. I work for the Democratic Party, so I, I'll be wholly honest. This is not because we love the Democratic Party. Definitely. We got, we got two choices. Like right. Both of them are pretty crappy. But one is obviously way more crappy than the other one. So you choose the less crappy one. And that's what we do. That's generally been the black, that's generally been black voting in this country since we could with Grant, right? It's mm -hmm. usually we're choosing between two pretty racist white people and we try to choose the less racist one. Now, it used to be Republicans. Then that switched and now it's Democrats. So that's why we always vote in this 90% block for one for one party. It's not, we don't have the luxury of like, oh, we want this person that has these issues. Voting is always a survival for us. It always has been. It's uh, which white man is not going to kill us as much? <laughs> which white man is not going to make it as hard for us? So that's why we end up voting that way for the party. But if it was, if so I think Obama was unique in the fact that he came when there was a wholesale massive failure of government, like there was with the 2008 crash, he also had a team behind him that cultivated that image, right? He all that cultivated that image. People forget. I think they did a great job of painting him as Obama, hope and change, Obama, the revolutionary. A lot of that was because of what? How people view black people, right? He was black, so therefore he was automatically revolutionary. Rebellious. Right. Hell, they didn't even think he was born in the country. People right. are like, Hawaii's a state? They're like, nah, I want to see his birth certificate. Like, that that's how wild it was. When, in fact, who was Obama really? Ivy League educated, backed by Wall Street, and a huge Chicago machine. A millions of white men like Obama have been elected. <laughs> but right. he became revolutionary because he was black. <laughs> and then we fell asleep after that. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> We felt we like thought we, it was over. Yeah. We, we thought it like, was over. Yeah. He yep. was only able to do one thing. Now, it was a great thing. It was a revolutionary thing. Like, you see the Overton window has been shifted on health care now. Now, yeah. everybody has to get health care. You see, even, even, even Trump is like, I want to cover everybody. So he shifted the Overton window with that. And obviously, health care is a huge issue for all of us, particularly black people, because you see... Uh, the health disparities that's been shown in coronavirus. Right. So that's going to be Obamacare, and you see they can't get rid of it. So mm -hmm. that's like that's that's revolutionary. The so social media was it was imperative in getting him elected. That is correct, Mr. Gardner. And we see we see how social media is being leveraged by who by the man in the White House who shall remain nameless. Uh, that was a large part of his success as well, but. I think Obama's family, I think being black was more important than them being uh, women and therefore less threatening mm -hmm. uh, as far as assault on the White House. Yeah. But I will tell you this, David, the move for black female BP is due to that. It's due to it being less threatening. It's due to it being, hey, we've already had a black man. Like it's time for a black woman as if like, we have to check off the box. Like we've had one black man. Let's get one black woman also. <laughs> Dude, I, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> go, hey, we got time, yeah. man. Go ahead. Man, we've been on here over an hour. And uh, I yeah. am so, <laughs> it. And uh, before I let you go, um, I do want to give you some time to just have the floor to yourself to uh, tell everyone what you're doing, how they can uh, follow you, how they can see some of the things you're doing. And hopefully um, we can get you on here. Um, I would love to have a panel and I love panels. And the reason why I love panels, I love talking to you one on one. But if I can get two or three educated minds on here, someone could bring out something and we we have a regular panel, Dr. Gardner, who, who's on here all the time, and uh, Dr. Walker. They were my guests last night. I would love to add you to that mix one sure. night, and we can just go at it. And I'm telling you, if we can get the three of you guys' minds together, 
we really can can hit some 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 things. So I'm gonna give you, the floor, give you the floor so you can um, just tell us what we need to know, how we can get in touch with you, what you have going on, your programs, talk talk about your show in particular. What ha sure and again, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, the website is www.killingthebreeze.com. Like I said, Killing the Breeze is uh, it's uh, kind of we're a media apparatus that's focused on archiving and advancing data information uh, from all perspectives, um, racially, se racially, sexual orientation, gender, et cetera, et cetera. We, we take all people who have something to say, they write for us, they podcast for us, they shoot videos for us. Um, I'm a teacher. We can talk about that later. We, that's it. That's correct, Mr. Wright. Uh, we're focused on, at a granular level, civics and government and U.S. history. We don't know where we're going until we know where we've come from. We also don't know what to do until we know what the rules are. So our real focus is on civics, history, government, economics, media literacy, environmental literacy, all of the things that we need that make us better citizens. If we're better citizens overall, then, e then we'll easily, easily be able to make improvements within our own community. I'm a teacher. If you make contact with me, I'll get in contact. Uh, I'll be able to tell you a little bit more about the programs going on at my school. I can tell you it is the St. Francis Academy in Baltimore, Maryland. We are the oldest black institution in the country. We're the oldest black educational institution in the country. We started in 1828, and I want to say the Western Hemisphere. We opened our doors in 1828, uh, and uh, we actually opened it before the oldest black Catholic organization, the Oblate Sisters in America, started in 1829. So we've been educating black people for a hundred and... 1920, 2020, almost 190 years. Okay. Something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually coming up upon 200 uh, in eight years from now. So yeah, 190 years. Right. So re please you reach out you reach out to me. Um, I'll be able to talk with you about that uh, and how we can get involved in that because like that's been a part of my mission now. Being if we're at the if we're the oldest black educational institution in the Western Hemisphere, it's incumbent upon us to produce black men and black women that are going to better our society, not only here, but in the world, the black community in the world, the diaspora, if you will. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at B Moore in Brooklyn. And I guess I can write it down <laughs> at B Moore in Brooklyn. You can follow me there at Insta on Instagram. It's at Killing the Breeze. And again, it's always the same mission, archiving, advancing, protecting data, information, news, media, uh, from all perspectives, but particularly uh, with the center of blackness, right? I'm black. Uh, a lot of our writers and contributors are, you know, obviously we have them all races, uh, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera, but we're black owned business. And I think it's key that we have our perspective told in the media at large. So I'd love to be able to come back on and talk with uh, uh, talk with your allies, talk with, be a part of a panel. I have these discussions all the time. And fortunately, I'm unencumbered. Now, I'm, it's, it's good that I'm able to, uh, I'm able to talk freely in spite of, you know, by, responsibilities to my shareholders of my company and right. to the school that I teach and to any uh, political candidates and campaigns that I might be working on. Right. So it works for me. I Again, this was fantastic, though. I cannot thank you enough for this opportunity, for this discussion. The, the time just flew by. <laughs> yes, it, did. it did. It really did. Well, we're going to work on that real soon. We're going to work on setting up a panel. We can come back and just spend some time we may just have to break it up for a couple of days because we can't we can't hit everything but if we can just, yeah <laughs> it's, it's a start you know people say I'm tired. we got to start somewhere we do 
we, have to we do. And there's action. There's action that definitely can be taken. And perhaps this will be the impetus sport for some people. Yes. If we can, if you have, li- we have listeners that will listen to you, listen to your expertise, your panelists' expertise, and we can get one or two or 20 or 200 to launch into action, then we've done something. Right. All right. Thank you, my brother. You have a good rest of the evening. I'll be in touch with you real soon so we can set this thing up. Absolutely. But thank right. you. Thank you, my friend. Bye. All right. I want to thank my uh, our guest tonight, our brother Quasi France, who I think just blew us away tonight. This information was so valuable. This information was priceless. Uh, it was a good conversation, and it also set us up for future conversations in which we're going to uh, come back here. We're going to do what we need to do to uh, make sure that we start the effort. This was, uh, as Dr. Gardner uh, is letting us know, is an excellent, I think it was excellent discussion. I just love getting quality minds. I love, someone said, I believe it was T.D. Jakes that said one time, if I'm the smartest person in the room, then the rest of you are fired. If I'm the smartest person on the show, you're not coming back. I want someone on here that really knows what they're doing and what they're talking about. And certainly our brother Quasi France uh, was very informative, very articulate. He nailed it on the head. He, he just had no limitations. There's some things that we need to talk about. And the key that I took away from it that we really need to focus on is it's more than us just being black men in America. We need to talk about what it is to be black men in our community. And once we become strong black men in our community, then we can spread it out and we can impact our nation and therefore impact the world. I appreciate you spending time with us tonight. I want to challenge you as I always do to share this broadcast. Hit the share button, hit the like button, go to YouTube, subscribe because it's going to be on there. Do a watch party. Make sure that others get a chance to see this broadcast tonight with Quasi France, uh, a powerful speaker tonight. Help us to stay on the air as long as we can do this by supporting us at dollar sign Eagle, E A G L E, Austin, A L S T O N, any amount will help us. We wanted to be last night. We want we wanted to be a blessing to our guests. When we have our panel discussion on, we want to be a, able to uh, do something special for them. We're going to work real quick on getting this panel together and having three powerful men, educated men, not just men with an attitude. We talked about uh, hip hop and rap. Oh, we're not just going to have NWA on here. We're going to have some educated men that know what we're talking about and maybe someone will see something that they can take and go back out into the community and let me say this to those that said well i'm tired of just hearing about the talk i'm tired of you guys just coming on and talking it's working our conversation is working anytime a young man watches this broadcast and calls me and says i've been watching i've been following the show and i want to run for office to make a difference My friends, that is worth the investment of our time and our finances. I was thrilled to hear that, and I couldn't wait to talk to him about it. Anytime someone says, I'm ready to make a difference and stop talking about it, how do I get my name in the hat? That's when I got excited and said, yes, we're making a difference. This wasn't a 60 or a 70-year-old when a young man says, I'm ready to do it. That means it was worth it. What more can I say? Your contribution, as Brother Quasi said, because we're getting our support from you, we're not limited to what we can talk about because someone sponsored us. When someone sponsors us, now we've got to talk about what they want us to talk about. There are lines we can't cross. We can't say this, but because it's your support, we can get on here and we can talk about what matters to you. And so I thank you, those of you that are watching that have been supporting. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. We wouldn't be on here tonight if it wasn't for your contribution. So my friends, I want to thank you for that. And I wanted to tell you that I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. We'll be back here tomorrow night. 
We'll be back here tomorrow night with a special guest. We, our guest yesterday was David Walker. His brother Robert's going to be with us. And then we're going to have a special guest that coming up soon. We're trying to work out the, all of the details, get you a special guest on here. And we're going to talk about uh, how the racial tension has spilled over into the church. And we want to talk to someone that has experienced it firsthand and how we're what we're doing to mend this gap. Because we can't live the rest of our lives mad at them. They're mad at us. They're frustrated with us. We're frustrated with them. We've got to work together. We've got to come together. So my friends, I thank you for your time tonight. I thank you for tuning in. Don't forget, hit the share button. Hit the share button. Hit the share button. I know we ask for your financial support to keep coming back. You may not be able to do anything financially, but it won't cost you anything to just click share. That's all. Just let it pop up on your screen so that someone can see quasi France and the comments and the remarks and the things that we talked about tonight. I want to ask you a question before you go to bed tonight because you're going to sleep in a little bit. And I want to challenge you when you go to bed tonight to look yourself in the mirror before you go to bed. Go in the bathroom or look in your or just pull up a mirror, look in your cell phone, whatever. Look yourself in the eye and ask yourself a question today, today. Did I do something to make my life better? Did I do something to work toward my destiny? Did I do something to make my world a better place to live in? Did I do something to make the next generation be able to survive in this world? Or did I simply waste another day? Tomorrow, don't you waste any time. Get busy. Do something. Anything matters during times like this. Follow the sign of the times and we will get to where we need to get to. I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. And I'll see you right here on tomorrow night with Sign of the Time. Sleep well, my friend.